Hello everyone, welcome to the Prayer of Recollection Reflections. Uh, this is March 27th, 2020, and we're going to be reading Luke 19, 11 through 27. Here we go. The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said, and because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. He said, a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, Invest this for me while I'm gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called his servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You're a good servant. You've been faithful with the little I entrusted you, so you'll be the gover governor of ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You'll be governor of five cities. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared, your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and who harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But master, they said, he already has ten pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And as for these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them here and execute them right in front of me. Bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. So, this is interesting. Uh, it's kind of interesting how he says that he did this to clarify the impression that the kingdom of God wouldn't begin right away. Um, but it's a little bit of a perplexing story, and I'm wondering how clarifying it would have been to everyone, or would it have been more confusing? But in hindsight, I'm sure that they got it. Um, so I'll tell you some of my reflections. Um, I think that the noble man was Jesus, um, and that he, uh, going to a distant land to get crowned is him going to heaven after his death, where he will be crowned. And I think that, um, he needed to correct the impression that everyone around him had that he was going to be a, an earthly king and immediately because they were waiting, their prophecies made them expect someone who would be a national king and would free them from their national oppressors. They weren't expecting the spiritual king who would free them spiritually. So they thought he was going to come right over and become the king of everything right away, not go back to heaven first. Um, and I think that the ten servants would be people who are his disciples, um, who he asks to invest his his um, resources for him and um, the de delegation of people who hated him would be the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people who were his own people and did not want him to be their king. Um, this is interesting to me um, when it says down a little ways, so you, what, uh, you've you been faithful with the little I entrusted you, so you'll be the governor of ten cities as your reward. And that makes me wonder, uh, do we have responsibilities in heaven? Like, going from managing one pound of silver to governing ten cities seems like, you know, sometimes we think of heaven as just sitting around and years and years of singing and dancing and um, just enjoying God. But this sounds more like there might be responsibilities and things that will be entrusted to us there much more so than here even like does that mean that this is like that being on earth is like being a servant managing a pound of silver 
versus being a governor with many cities to manage. Which I gotta say, that doesn't sound like a reward to me. I don't think I would want to be a governor of 10 cities or five. But I think that must have been considered a reward in their culture. And I have full trust that whatever God has in store for us will be, will be a wonderful reward, despite what my human frailties um, interfere with my perspective now. Uh, let's see. Let me look at this note here. Um, another related question, and we've I think we've kind of touched on this question before, is are there going to be variable levels of rewards in heaven? Uh, this certainly does seem to imply that in this story. And um, now let's move on to that third servant. And um, so interesting what he his excuse, I guess we'll call it. He says, Master, I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. Well, <clears throat> I think that this may have been a lie and a story that he was telling himself because nowhere else in the story does it imply that the master is that way. Even in his response, if you look at it, he says, if you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine, he's not saying he is. He's saying, if you knew that, you would have handled the money differently if that's what you truly believed. And when he says your own words condemn you, I think he's saying, you don't even truly believe that. Otherwise, you would have taken a different action than you took. Um, so I think that this guy is basically lying to himself and trying to lie to God. And he is um, living in those deceptions. And, and I even wondered if, I don't know, this doesn't probably make sense, but I wondered if putting in the bank would have symbolized um, at least taking God for yourself, even if you didn't try to share him with anyone else, but taking his love and his greatness inside of you. Um, that might be kind of what putting it in the bank is. But on the other hand, that kind of goes against what we've been talking about with Christianity being an all or nothing. It doesn't seem like that's the nature of Christianity. It would be something that you can just keep inside yourself. Otherwise, you wouldn't really have um, given him your whole self, your whole life, all your resources. Um, okay, let's go a little farther down here. Um, I think that when he says you can take what was his and give it to the guy who had ten, I wondered if he was saying basically you can take it because it, he never made it his own. So it's not like you're taking something from him. He never made God his own. He never owned God as his or made that commitment to God. You're taking something that he chose not to have and not to use. And um, and then it makes me wonder, when we get to heaven, I mean, because he, he implies that we get to keep what we have, the coins that we earn, Will we have something that we keep? I've always kind of thought it is just bringing our new bodies, our new selves. Not that we would have any, you know, I guess uh, maybe this goes back to that C.S. Lewis thing about how your, um, if I understood what he was saying in Mere Christianity, he was implying that your character, you establish the trajectory of your character over your lifetime. And after your lifetime into eternity, your character will continue on that trajectory throughout eternity. So if you're growing closer to God, you will just continue to grow closer and closer and closer, that you basically claim your character while you're here and you carry that into the next life. If your character is downwards, it's going to continue to become more and more so over eternity. And so what may not seem like a radical character slip over an 80-year lifespan over an eternity, you continue that trajectory and it will become horrific. So, um, so maybe that's part of what he's talking about with keeping the resources you have, not being of wealth or possession or status, but again, being that what you have with God, you will get to keep for eternity and you will get more and more because you've established 
a capacity to have God and you've emptied yourself out of yourself, making more room for him to come in throughout all eternity. Um, so that, that kind of would make sense to me, I guess. Um, let's see, I thought there was a comment. I, you know, I wanted to make just a personal comment on the, um, when it said, Master, I invested your money and made 10 times the original amount that like, that's the one I want to be. Um, but I also struggle with like, that feels kind of selfish. But when I dig into it, I think it's not selfish because I, I think that that's like the perfect alignment. That's how God intended it to be. That the more we get for him, do for him, not like we can earn it, but just what we are able to give of ourselves and our resources, our energy, our minds, our love to him, the more he is glorified and the better our lives become. So it's the best for everyone. That's the ideal. It's better for God and it's better for us because he made it that way to be perfectly mutually reinforcing. I praise you, Jesus. Okay, so I've got Anna here. I wanted to bring her in because we've been talking about this um, verse a lot. And um, Anna's, one of the reasons I wanted Anna in here is because it was her who got me to originally thinking about how the um, third servant, that something was awry there with his story. And so Anna, tell us what were your clues that you could tell something was awry with his story. Uh, did you already talk about how you said that you thought he was just another bad king if a bad king does this analogy? No, I didn't tell them that. You tell them that. Uh, Martha said maybe he says that he's a hard man because it's like the one where isn't it the bad judge who says, I'm a bad judge and I hate people. Even if he can make a fair decision, this king can make a fair decision even though he's a bad king. But I didn't think he was a bad king because it doesn't insinuate that anywhere else and you'll notice that I just claimed that as my own idea when I did the vlog I didn't even tell you that was Anna's idea that was my idea and he says I was afraid because you're a hard man to deal with saying what isn't Mom. yours and the hard thinking what isn't yours and the harvesting crops is in the plant and he says if you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvest crops I didn't plant. Which, see, it doesn't seem like something a hard man would say. I said, it seems like the hard man would say, no, that's not true. <laughs> but then we're thinking, well, in the, in the bad judge, he did say, I'm a bad judge and I hate people. He said that out loud, so maybe that's not it but uh that it just did not seem right it felt like weird to put that detail in and not talk about it anywhere else nice thank you anna